All right, everyone, I think this is close enough, so let's get this one kicked off today. So thanks for joining this uh, webinar series through Anger, Micro, and Cisco. Today we're going to be focusing on remote working solutions and security with Cisco. Obviously, with everything that's going on in the world right now, um, working remotely is top of mind for not only us over here, um, but for you guys as well. So we wanted to make sure we have a good presentation to kind of run through the different offers and pre um, promotions that Cisco has going on right now. Um, so with that being said, I'm just going to quickly go to the agenda so we can talk about what we're going to be covering. So we have Matt and Chris from our collaboration team, as well as Paul. So they're going to be talking about um, Cisco collaboration and how it fits all. Um, the different COVID-19 promotions that are available through Cisco. And then we're going to kind of wheel it back a little bit towards security. So myself, uh, Colin Rowan, and Tom Mann are going to talk to how to protect remote workers with Cisco security and touch on the different offerings through security as well through the COVID-19 offers. Um, definitely stay on towards the end because we're going to have Jess from Cisco actually talk about the different financing offers that are going on right now as well. Um, so as you can see, we have a packed agenda. And with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who is one of our collaboration experts, and I'm going to have him take the, uh, take the ball. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I mean, pretty much going into this presentation, really we want to make sure that people are aware of how security fits into a lot of different areas, and one of those being collaboration. Now, you guys know that Cisco has pieces that fit all the different scenarios when it comes to rooms and at home, and no matter what way you need to get your meeting done, Cisco has a solution for it. Even if you're connecting into other solutions, uh, we can tie into those as well. So really what I wanted to show you first off is how many pieces can play into a basic scenario. So you have your, your standard WebEx device, whether that be your laptop or your phone, uh, that's tying into WebEx directly. And that could be all you're using at your end. And that it's in itself is secure. So WebEx, the WebEx platform is secure from your laptop up into the cloud, and it, it even secures it at rest there as well. So your information while it's stored at the WebEx cloud is still encrypted. You also have proximity that is connecting you wirelessly if you are using a room system. And that piece itself is uh, also secure as well, and we'll go into that a little bit more in another slide. And then the video endpoints, just like if you're using your, your base device, those are going to be secure. And they implement certain things as well into those devices to keep them more secure, like being able to set up a secure Wi-Fi network in that room. So there's actually a connection off the back of those that you can tie a access point into that allows you to have secure access in the room itself. For people that may be joining your Wi-Fi, but you don't want them on your corporate Wi-Fi, so say you want them on a specific guest Wi-Fi, you could have that in the room by itself and not have to have that tied in to the rest of yours and, and provide an opening there for security. And then also the WebEx board itself, because it's still running that same platform, it's still secure, and all these up and go through the WebEx cloud. So they're, again, going to be secured on that side as well, up through the Internet and everywhere else. Now, as far as what Cisco does on the collaboration side and making sure that they're secure, a lot of the other people out there have been caught with issues recently, and Cisco, that's not the way Cisco works. They think of security from the very beginning. As they're building these processes, as they're building the actual products, they're putting security as a first and foremost point in their agenda. So when you're looking here at industry standards and certifications on the left-hand side, these are a lot of different security things that different organizations need or different governments need to make sure that you're authorized for them to use it. So like the FedRAMP certified customers, that's something that U.S. government officials and U.S. government agencies are looking to make sure that it's secure enough for them to use. And then you also have like Privacy Shield Framework certified, which is for use in other countries, Cloud Computing Compliance Control Catalog, that's also other countries. So not just the U.S. and security standards that we adhere to, but security standards that other people adhere to as well. And then it's not just Cisco saying that they're doing this. They actually have a third party come in and audit them. So that service organization controls, SOC 2, type 2 audited. That means that on a regular basis, Cisco actually has a third party co company come in and audit their processes. So not only do they have these SOPs in place to make sure that things are staying secure, but the, this audit company is making sure that the people are following those SOPs or following those practices that they put in place so that it is actually secure and they're not just saying, oh yeah, you can be as secure as you want, but if people aren't using the security features, then they're gonna be running into problems. And that's one of those things when we come to the right-hand side of the slide is some of those features that you can actually implement on your basis of uh, to keep your system free from issues that you might run into because of concert, concert, yeah, security concerns. 
uh, the account management is one of those big things. So if you're on a free account or a free WebEx account, you definitely want to move up to a more enterprise level or managed account at a corporate level because these are really going to give you a lot of extra features that you can then, as an administrator, push on down to everybody else that's in your organization. So whether that may be a time frame that you have to keep files or communications in your records, you can do that. Uh, there are also, also things like setting up a basic password and making sure that everybody has at least a set password. Maybe it be a certain number of character limits or a certain type of characters that you want to have as part of those passwords. You can do that as well. And then there's also meeting security settings. So the meeting security settings are at your level itself. So as a user, you can actually set up things in there to say like only people that have a account on my WebEx organization can actually join my meetings or only people that have an account over all of WebEx can join my meeting so we know who it is that is joining and if there's an issue we can check back into it and try to figure out what happened uh, and then you can also if you wanted to and be more open like in this particular type of forum we allowed you guys to register for the event but at the same time we're just pretty much allowing everybody to register for the event so we have a little bit more information about who's attending but we're not going as deep saying hey you can't attend based off of this criteria there's also the personal room security settings so a lot of other softwares out there they give you a personal type room, so a room that you can spin up on the fly, but they remove a lot of the security settings that go along with that type of setup, where Cisco keeps those as part of that personal room security piece as well. So you can still have those passwords, still have that registration piece, things like that that you can do to make sure that people, when they are joining, are the right people that are joining your meetings. And then we also have single sign-on, so you can tie this into a larger organization and say, okay, I don't want to have to have people remember passwords for every single application that we're using. So you can tie that into single sign-on, which means that people are more apt to use stronger passwords, because the more passwords they have to remember, usually the less secure those passwords become. And then we also have end-to-end -end encryption via voice over IP. So if you're using voice over IP to connect into WebEx, you can actually enable this as a feature and have end-to-end -end encryption from point A to point B across, so that way you're not having to worry about it being, being decrypted at any point along the way. Now, if you're having to allow people to phone dial in, then that end-to-end -end encryption obviously wouldn't work for the phone side of it. So you just have to make sure that you're offering people the way you want them to join to stay as secure as you can be. You also have some other meeting security settings. We digged into those a little bit more. We touched on passwords, but the unlisted meetings there's, these are things that people don't use often. So when you actually create a, a meeting, you can do it as listed or unlisted. Unlisted allows you to keep that more private so it's not visible to a lot of other people in your organization. And that way you have to like type in the meeting number or things like that to really get access to it uh, versus having that listed on a long list of all the meetings that are happening in your organization. We touched on requiring accounts. Uh, we also have joining after the host. So one of the things that often happens is, is people join into a meeting, and if they're there before the host, they can start chatting about whatever they want to chat about in other platforms. In WebEx, you can actually have it so that they can't join before the host, or if, they, if you do allow them to join before the host, they can't actually communicate via audio. They can set everything up, but they can't talk to each other until you join. So that way you can keep a little bit better tabs on what's being disseminated out through your medium. And then uh, we touched on personal room security, and then we also have restricted access to be able to block certain people from being able to join. I touched on proximity a little bit earlier for that wireless connection to the rooms. So wireless connections are often innately insecure. The easier you make something to be able to use, usually the less secure it is. That's not the case with proximity. So proximity uses an audio signal to communicate with your laptop or your phone to know that you're in the room and to know that, hey, this is a person that's trying to join a meeting from this room. Now, because that is an audio signal, it is a lot more secure than other forms of Wi-Fi because you actually have to be within audio distance of that device. And you can actually go in there and adjust those audio levels down if you wanted to, to make it so that you have to be closer to the device to be able to use it. So if you're in a more open forum and you have people that could technically hear it over a wall or things like that, you can lower those audio volumes so that they aren't being heard outside of the presenter area. And you can also see who is connected via the Touch 10, so that way if someone does connect that you aren't hope or you don't want to have connected, you can also remove them via the Touch 10 if you would prefer. And then it, we talked about end-to-end -end encryption a little bit earlier as well. It, in WebEx Teams, you actually have true end-to-end -end encryption. So you can encrypt at your laptop. It goes over the internet, through the 
Cisco Cloud back down to someone else's laptop, and then it gets decrypted at their laptop. So there's a key at your end, and there's a key at their end, and everywhere through the middle, it is not decrypted. So that's true end-to-end -end encryption that's right there with WebEx Team. So you don't even have to go to a really high-end product to get those encryption pieces that other people are saying, okay, you have to go to a much higher end solution to get that type of level encryption, or maybe they're not even there yet to offer that type of level encryption, where Cisco has that today and you can get that. And that's a big piece that I've been having a lot of customers ask me about, right, in the last, uh, I'd say, month is <laughs> security and how secure is this solution. And they want to make sure that they're keeping communications open with their employees, but at the same time, they're not opening in themselves up to vulnerabilities. So that said, I'd like to pass this over to Chris, and he's going to talk a little bit about some of the offerings that Cisco has out there on the collab side. Thanks, Matt. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining today. And I, I just kind of wanted to highlight a few more things that Matt was talking about as it relates to security and, and, and meetings, per se. Um, but a few things that I started to use more frequently in times where, you know, we have to work from home more often. Um, is the, the host options and some of the host security settings that we can do specifically around room locks, right? So <clears throat> Cisco has a feature that's built into personal rooms as well as just standard WebEx meetings where the host can actually either pre-assign an automatic lock um, so they could go into their, their administration page and say, I want my meetings to automatically lock five minutes after I've started them, meaning once the meeting has started um, and the people that are inside the meeting are collaborating, after five minutes, the, the room will automatically lock, meaning nobody else can join after uh, that five-minute period. Now, in the host sense, um, if that does happen and somebody is late, um, because that happens a lot, the host actually gets a notification that says that this person is trying to join. Uh, this person is placed into a virtual you know, waiting room, a lobby, and once the host admits them to the meeting, they can then join and collaborate. Um, there's also a setting, if you don't have this pre-configured, in the actual meeting uh, center administration, in the configuration of the actual meeting itself. So uh, on the toolbar at the bottom, there's a, a dot, dot, dot bubble. If the host clicks that, they'll have the ability to automatically lock the room um, by choosing the lock option there. Um, and then last but not least, if somebody has joined your room and you don't want them to be in your room, um, the host can actually right-click that user on their participant page and actually expel that user from the meeting. And um, that's, in a nice way, kick them out um, and uh, then lock the room from there. And a cool thing about room locks, too, is it's not just specific to everybody. So you, you don't have to just say that after five minutes that this room is completely locked to everybody. You can actually set that up so that only people outside of your organization is locked after those five minutes. And that way people inside your organization, you can have access and still get through and not have to worry about, as the presenter, letting people into your room consistently as they're arriving late or whatever it may be. So if you've got a lot of people that you have inside your company that are attending your meetings and a few stragglers outside your company, you can make sure that only to those people that you aren't in your trusted network are having to be let into those meetings as well. Yeah, it looks like exactly. uh, Tom's pretty excited about the uh, kicking people out feature. So I think he's going to be using that feature. <laughs> There's a sense of joy in kicking somebody out of your WebEx meeting. <laughs> um, all right, so I guess I'll uh, talk a little bit about what Cisco is doing um, around the, the COVID-19 pandemic messaging and what Cisco is providing uh, in the collaboration space. Um, so at the end of this presentation, we're going to go ahead and provide you these slides. And what I will tell you is the link that's linked right here in this slide is, is pretty much the main to go-to resource for all of the offers, whether they're collaboration-focused or not. Uh, that's based around COVID-19. So um, some of the stuff that we're going to highlight here is just kind of touching the surface of some of the things that Cisco is doing to uh, assist partners and customers in this time where the need to work from home is obviously, you know, super increased and heightened. So a few things um, that we'll touch base on first uh, from a partner level is is the, the Coop Cloud program. This isn't a new program. This has been around for, for years, actually. Um, but it's important to note that a lot of the offers that Cisco is is you know, delivering to the partners. The partners need to have the proper authorizations and the proper requirements first to do these offers, right, to, to spin up trials for customers. Um, so I felt it very fitting to start here first. So if you are a partner, um, you know, that, that has collaboration SaaS authorization, meaning you can sell Cisco WebEx uh, solutions today, um, you can 
you could go ahead and apply for the Coop Cloud program if you're not already enrolled. There's a number of benefits um, that are based around the Coop Cloud solution. Um, it essentially, it gives the partner direct access and free use of internal licensing for the organization. So you're going to get full-blown WebEx uh, meeting suite. You're going to get WebEx Teams. Um, you're going to get video device registration licenses as well. So if you want to order NFR video systems, you can do that and uh, play around with it. The ultimate goal. Uh, from Cisco's eyes is to make sure that, you know, you're using the technology, you become a better advocate of the technology, and obviously you sell more to your customers. The other benefit is you get access to your own WebEx Control Hub, which is the administration side of, of the portal where you not only configure your own organization, but you can also manage your customers. So if you've sold WebEx to, you know, customers, whether they're, you know, A-Flex solutions or A-SBK solutions, which are a little bit older, um, those customers actually show up in your partner page when you first log into your WebEx Control Hub. Another added feature and another added benefit as it relates directly to this COVID-19 messaging is this is where partners spin up trials, right? Um, there's no CCW estimate creation. There's no special portal for it. There's no one-off request for trials. The trials are done through the WebEx Control Hub, and partners need to have access to this. And to do that, they need to be uh, collaboration SaaS authorized and have uh, enrolled in the Coop Cloud program to do so. By the way, if any of you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A. Um, we'll be happy to answer them. So Cisco is offering free enterprise trials to customers. Now, what I will tell you is this was a messaging that was provided about a month ago. Um, and since then, Cisco's actually halted some of the, the enterprise trial capability um, because what happened was, if you can just imagine, Lots and lots of customers uh, needed to rapidly turn on, you know, meeting center solutions, work from home solutions, and Cisco found out that the spike in need um, required additional enhancements to the WebEx data centers, right? So we're, they're rapidly um, working on spinning up, you know, more virtualization solutions, uh, you know, more servers to support the need to provide all those meeting minutes, all those uh, people collaborative, you know, collaborating on the WebEx meeting platform you know, to do that. What I will tell you is the link that I provided in that first slide, um, there is an excep exception form. So if you are a partner and you're, you're used to doing trials in the control hub, uh, you might notice that the trial option is kind of grayed out. It doesn't let you do that. Um, if you have a customer that is very pressing, right, and they absolutely need something um, from a trials perspective, there is an exception form at the link that I provided. You can, you can fill out the exception form. It goes to an exceptions team at Cisco. They're going to review it, and they'll either approve it or disapprove it. Um, in working with a few partners most recently on that exception form, the messaging that I've heard from Cisco is that um, for, for customers that need trials to try to get an exact number of users that need trials. I think what happened was a lot of trials were being spun up for, you know, 250 users, for instance, and only half of that uh, trial is actually being utilized. So I think Cisco wants to right-size the amount of, of, you know, resources they're spinning up on the data center side to make sure that it's properly sized and it's properly being utilized by the customers when doing a trial. Okay? Cisco is also allowing for expansion in existing customers, right? So there's a lot of customers out there that have purchased WebEx, whether they're through a named user offer, an active user offer, or an enterprise agreement. So with enterprise agreements, you all know that if you sell a meetings enterprise solution, which is 250 users and higher, automatically when you sell the solution, the Cisco provides 20% uh, license growth built into that um, EA agreement. Um, so customers that already have EAs, make sure that they are fully aware um, that they can actually utilize up to 20% more of what they're actually buying automatically. You can go ahead and add users directly into the control hub, and Cisco will go ahead and support that at no additional charge. Active users is a unique offer where there's really no cap, although customers are paying for a specific number, so a, a specific quantity. Um, the active user model lets the organization scale depending on the overall needs of, of, of the requirements for customers and, and users to spin up meetings. Um, what Cisco has committed to is uh, between the time period of February and May, they're not actually going to go and account for the spike in the requirement and need uh, for, for users to spin up and host meetings, right? Because typically how this offer works is after, you know, the first year, 
uh, Cisco will do a look back in the 9, 10, and 11 month period. And then from there, uh, they'll do a true forward where they'll say, okay, you're paying for 200 user licenses. On average, you actually had 250 active hosts this year. So for year two, we're going to adjust that number to 250. What this offer is saying is Cisco's not going to look at February to May as, you know, increase and spike of, of meeting center uh, hosts uh, when they account for that true forward um, piece. And then last but not least is named user. So named user in its simplistic form was um, whatever the customer bought, whatever quantity they bought is however many licenses they got. So typically named user was in the smaller uh, SMB type markets, um, you know, where a customer may have purchased 20 or 30 named user meeting center licenses. In this case, in these types of organizations, Cisco is actually allowing those uh, users to add up to 20% additional headcount at no additional charge, and you don't actually have to go into CCW and make a change modification. You can actually just go ahead and add users to the uh, to the, co to the customer's uh, WebEx control hub to uh, to allow them to permit them to do uh, WebEx meetings and Teams. Okay. If there's something beyond that, again, there is a a link um, on that page that I'm going to share with you. There's an exception form that you can fill out. So, in, for instance, you know. EA customers already use 20% more and they need additional, that would be a use case of fill out the exception form, Cisco will review it, and then provide feedback on that exception. Cisco is also providing uh, the ability to do large uh, focused events uh, in the form of WebEx Event Center 3000. Um, we are on WebEx Event Center right now, so this is what the platform looks like. Um, and this solution has become very, mu very much more popular in today's world because a lot of organizations need to do uh, all hands meetings where they need to bring the entire company on. Uh, maybe organizations are doing webinars uh, like we're doing today where they need to support a number of people and they want it to be a listen-only environment, right? They don't want that necessary collaboration you have on Standard Meeting Center. Um, you know, they want to basically have the ability for hosts and panelists um, and have the people join and listen, and they have the ability to record and ask questions and do chat and all that stuff. Essentially, that's what Event Center is for. This offer is talking about a uh, Event Center offer that's available free um, to, to customers for three months. Um, the one got you here is if the customer um, that you're working with um, already has a WebEx subscription, make sure they don't already have Event Center already. Um, Enterprise agreements and active user agreements include the WebEx meeting suite, which automatically include Event Center for up to 1,000 participants. Of course, if the customer needs to support an event larger than 1,000, this would be a good offer to look at. Uh, typically, named users uh, are more of the a la carte approach, although you can do main, uh, named user meeting center suite, which again, includes all of the WebEx centers. So make sure the customer doesn't have Event Center already before you go ahead and do this offer. Um, if the customer doesn't and they need it, you have to do this through A-Flex and it has to be on its own subscription. You cannot make a change modification to an existing uh, customer that's on A-Flex that's utilizing WebEx today to add this. Because of the, the three, the three uh, months that are free and the way that Cisco is doing this on the back end, it has to be separate. Okay? And this is all detailed out on that link as well under the FAQ section, uh, Q question four. All right, with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Tom to talk a little bit about security. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. So what I wanted to talk about is actually how to protect remote workers. So to me, when you're considering a remote worker, we're using computers, we're going to the Internet, one of the first things someone might do with that computer or whatever device you're using is try to browse the web, go to websites or whatever type of Internet servers you're hitting. We want to make sure that, that experience is secure. We also, as you try to go to your corporate network or your applications, want to make sure we can trust the client devices and the fact that that's really our user that's doing it. So we want to be able to add trust to the client devices. <clears throat> the other piece is actually making sure malware isn't on that device. So we want to be able to secure that endpoint, whatever it is. And then finally, we want to be able to possibly get back to our corporate network. We might have resources there. Uh, so we want to secure remote access solution. So these are four big areas that you know, I'm going to talk about how Cisco has solutions for those. So basically, to meet up with those uh, 
uh, solutions I'm talking about, we have Cisco Umbrella, uh, Cisco Duo, Cisco M for endpoints, and Cisco AnyConnect uh, mobility client. All of these fill one of those four uh, important roles that I was just talking about. Cisco Umbrella doing the ability to securely browse the web and so on. So I'll talk about each of these a little bit in a, uh, as we go in a few slides on each. Uh, of how they work together and uh, why you would want to use these. As we take a look at it, the first one uh, I'd like to always go first with because it's first line of defense for the internet is kind of the tagline of Cisco Umbrella. The idea is as I try to go browse the web, I want to go to sites that don't have malware on them. So Cisco Umbrella does exactly that. It tracks all the good sites and the bad sites and tries to block me from going to the bad sites. If I can't get to the bad sites, I'm not gonna download malware from the bad sites. So that's fundamentally what Umbrella is doing. It is a cloud managed solution. So there's a cloud uh, dashboard to manage Umbrella. Um, it also helps reduce malware on your enterprise network or home users, wherever they are. Because if I'm not getting the bad sites, I'm not downloading that malware. Additionally, if someone does get something on their machine, a little bit of malware, and it tries to go get more malware, again, Umbrella is going to try to block that so that they can't get command and control or additional payload, uh, that type of thing. Internet access can be faster, too. Uh, that's not the first thing you think of. You're thinking of this as security. But the idea is if a percentage of my traffic going out my home network or my corporate network is going to malicious sites and downloading malware, those are going to be blocked so that frees up bandwidth for other users. The last big point on this slide, too, is provision globally admitted. So there are different deployment models and different integrations, but the most popular initial deployment can be done in minutes. Uh, Cisco did their San, Ho uh, uh, San Jose campus of 70,000 users in about 20 minutes and had immediate protection. When they first bought them and uh, changed the name to Umbrella, they protected all of Cisco Live conference and, uh, in the simple configuration. So it's very easy to configure and manage. It also adds a lot of visibility to that connection. Umbrella basically all starts with DNS. Uh, that's uh, the main way of uh, the main additions of Umbrella, the way it works. Is if I try to go to a website, say cisco.com, I don't connect to the name. Ultimately, DNS, domain name system, resolves that to an IP address, and then my computer makes an IP connection to that site. So what Umbrella does is it keep track, keeps track of all the good sites, the bad sites, and then it doesn't resolve uh, the bad sites to IP addresses. So my computer can't make a connection if it doesn't know what the IP address is. It's that simple. Uh, this type of protection precedes IP connections and basically means it could be used by all applications, all types of uh, communication, uh, because it's happening before the applications actually even do anything. And it doesn't matter what kind of hardware you have. Now, it can integrate into Cisco hardware, of course, but it can work with anybody's hardware, anyone's firewall router, anyone's computers can take advantage of Umbrella, depending on the situation. Oh, wrong way. There we go. Uh, the next piece here is the visibility and protection everywhere aspect of this. So I'm able to see as an administrator all the different sites, all the different malware being blocked, all the different web applications that the users are using. Uh, I could see from the dashboard, basically the administrator dashboard. So this includes even trying to police shadow IT all the different web applications people might be using that aren't authorized, you can see and block if you want to with Umbrella. The other nice thing is this works both on network and off network. So I could be at the headquarters office someday. Uh, I'll be back there maybe. Uh, but uh, basically IoT devices, PCs, phones, anything with an IP address trying to go to the internet gets protected. Roaming users, 
home users, I'm going to be, uh, it's going to protect laptops, desktops, iOS devices. And actually, they're getting close to having a solution for roaming Android that's right around the corner. So you're saying that everybody that has to work from home today can uh, use this as part of their corporate environment, but then even when they're not there and not being protected by what they might have been protected in the past, they can actually still be on the protection scale with Umbrella, correct? Yeah, yeah, so it doesn't matter if you're remote or in the office, there's a way to configure Umbrella to protect you wherever you are. Uh, absolutely, and this could be corporate managed devices. Uh, there, you could also have people use their own devices. Of course, you can see what traffic they're doing on those devices, so they would have to consent to that. The next piece of this is to make sure you, tr you trust the client devices the users are using. Uh, because if the user could be on a very insecure device with old software. Uh, it might not really be your user that's trying to access your application or your network. Uh, so Cisco Duo is, uh, comes into play in these circumstances. So it's part of Cisco's Zero Trust. Zero Trust is a whole industry initiative that's been around a couple years now. It's been pretty new in 2019 and 2020 for most people. But so the idea is to not trust who the user is or the device they're using without doing some additional authentication, no matter where the user is, on the corporate network or at home or wherever. So the idea is we want to confirm the identity of the user beyond username and password and want to make sure the device they're on is healthy and not vulnerable and really old software. So Duo then adds visibility of what software, how old their software is. Is it an old browser? Do they have old Java or Flash on there? And provides additional authentication uh, pieces, and we'll talk about some of that. So the first piece, when people who know Duo for a while, first thing you think of is multi-factor authentication, uh, MFA for short. Sure. So that's one of the main things it does for that identity, for that uh, trust level, is verify that the user is who they say they are. So the user logs in with the username and password, and then Duo does the second uh, form of authentication on top of that. Considered extremely secure, they consider it the uh, world's most secure and easiest to set up. Those are good combinations. It also works really well with a wide range of web applications. So these could be cloud applications up in Azure or AWS or your own servers back at the office. It easily integrates in with all these. Other big things is Duo could allow users to self-enroll. You don't have to use this feature, but this is great for students or, again, home users that need to get going quickly. There's a way they could self-enroll with Duo uh, using the corporate email to do the initial verification and start using Duo. Um, they also allows them to authenticate very quickly. Duo is fast, so when I hit allow, it does it, bam. Uh, and I don't have to enter any codes using the recommended method. So if I take a look at the different options with Duo, uh, the push is the most popular. That means I'm going to use an app on my phone or tablet to authorize my other devices, including the phone or tablet. However, if I don't have a modern smartphone or modern tablet around, Duo actually offers many other choices. You could have it call you. You could use a secure USB stick. Uh, it supports Apple Watch authentication, a whole bunch of different ways. So it's uh, basically as many options as you possibly could do. They do support. Uh, so that's an excellent way to go there. Uh, the next piece is security posture. So I alluded to this on one of the other slides. It actually could check your device's security, and this is either your phone or tablet or your PC or Mac, those type of things. Is the device managed? Is the software old? Is the device encrypted? That's more of a thing for the phone. Is it password protected? Is the firewall enabled? Uh, those type of things are all could be checked and logged so that the administrator in a nice dashboard can see if users' devices are secure and set policy to make sure that they have to be secure before they connect to all your applications. 
Uh, with that, there are three levels of dual. Uh, there's the basic MFA, which does that multi-factor authentication and gives you single sign-on to multiple applications. The mid-level, probably the most popular dual access, is going to add the ability uh, to have policies and look at device risk. And then dual beyond goes uh, beyond that, uh, allowing you to do full trusted devices, so trusted endpoints, um, and gather more information to the device. This slide just dives a little deeper into some of the features of each of the level. As you move up in feature uh, level, of course, uh, dual access does everything the MFA does, and dual beyond does everything of the, of the two below it. The next piece is securing your endpoints to make sure that device isn't loaded with malware and doesn't get malware. And that's where Cisco AMP for Endpoints comes into play. Cisco AMP for Endpoints uh, is basically an endpoint protection product and uh, an endpoint uh, detection response product. Traditionally, those were two different categories that have been merging. Uh, you know, some players have been around for years doing antivirus and endpoint protection. Then there are others doing detection and response and threat hunting, AMP does both, AMP for endpoints. So it gives you a lot of great capability. So this solution is actually a cloud-managed solution also. That's the main way it's used, although they, they do offer a private version where you could have on-prem appliances for air-gapped or maybe defense department type of scenarios. It supports Windows, Mac, some Linuxes, Android, and iOS, actually, and they just came out with a new Android version. Um, and then it's part of the AMP Everywhere integration. So the Cisco has firewalls, web appliances, email security appliances. All of them have the option to run some sort of AMP on those devices. If AMP for endpoints or any of the appliances see a piece of malware or learn that that's malware, it's shared so that the entire solution across the board can take advantage of that. Uh, so that's a huge value add, actually. Some of the main features are the ability, of course, to stop malware. You don't want malware getting in. So there's multiple top-of-line detection mechanisms and protection mechanisms to block malware, ransomware, and the latest attacks to really stop the riskiest attacks, even, and the most basic, too. Uh, but that top 1% of attacks can be very tough to stop. Plus, eliminating blind spots. Because this is cloud managed, I could uh, see the security posture of the malware, if the machine's infected, if it's up to date from a end for endpoint standpoint, and actually look at vulnerable software too with an end for endpoints, no matter where the device is. So, again, great for roaming users, home users, or in the office. Uh, it also allows you, if something did get in, uh, some new threat, some zero-day threat that nobody in the world knows about anywhere, it could allow you to easily proactively threat hunt for those type of threats. So those are some of the advantages here. AMP does take advantage, uh, and for endpoints, the AMP cloud. So all the AMP products communicate with this AMP cloud which keeps track of all the good files and bad files in the world and keeps like a, a hash of every single file. Is this file good, bad, or unknown? If it is unknown, it can use ThreatGrid, which is another cloud service, to do sandboxing in the cloud, where files can be uploaded there and run in virtual machines for protection. And all of these solutions take advantage of Cisco Talos, which is Cisco's intelligence organization which is the top one in the world, the largest and most sophisticated, other than government-run organization. So this is a private organization, of course. Uh, the next piece is to really do secure remote access. And in this case, we have Cisco AnyConnect. So AnyConnect, or the AnyConnect mobility client, uh, the reason they call it that, not just AnyConnect VPN, is it has a lot more features than just VPN. There's lots of modules that could run in it, like there's an umbrella module that could plug into it. There's actually an AMP for endpoints module that could plug in that could install AMP for endpoints from AnyConnect. AnyConnect is uh, one of the 
most used, most popular VPN clients out there. Um, it's highly secure, highly configurable, supports all the government standards that there are basically for a VPN client. It does require connecting to something though. So you are gonna need either an ASA firewall. Uh, in this case, I'm showing ASA hardware or ASA V would be the virtual solution. Uh, plus uh, firepower next generation firewalls would also be fully supported. Uh, so you'd need one of those, one or the other. And you can combine with Duo to do multi-factor authentication with any connect to make it even more secure. That's optional, not required. Uh, so the idea of the uh, AnyConnect Secure Mobility Client is to give any user highly secure access to the enterprise from any device at any time in any location. Notice the platforms. They support a lot of platforms, even ones that sound a bit older at this point. Uh, so that a wide range of support with this particular uh, VPN platform. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over uh, to Colin to talk about some additional options here. Awesome. Here Thank you go, very Colin. Much, Tom. Appreciate it. All right, so now I'm going to run through the different offerings that we have from a security platform, kind of like what Chris did earlier on the collaboration standpoint of things. Um, so the good thing with the security um, trials and offers that I'm going to go over is especially for like the demos, um, there's no type of certification needed for these as long as you're a Cisco registered partner. That's all that's going to be required. You're able to test any of these out. Um, and they do have a lot of um, expansion as um, previously what they used to have for these demos. So let me just go through these. So the good news is, is that every topic that Tom touched on, there's a demo or um, something going on for existing customers available. So it's like, uh, it's like Tom kind of read my mind with what I wanted to talk about. I didn't even show him his slides before he had his ready, so it was uh, it was good timing on his part. But um, so from an umbrella standpoint, typically when we talk about the demo, um, there's a free trial available for pretty much all security products. But especially for umbrella, we like to um, just put out there that there's a free 14-day trial with absolutely no restrictions. Like I said, as long as you're registered, you can try it out. Um, Typically, the, the flow I like to talk to partners about is instead of getting right into the demo, let's try to set up a, a custom demo with Tom and myself through the Experience Center so that rather than you're wasting days trying to figure out how the platform works, get familiar with the product, then actually demo it. So um, that's obviously still available. If anybody does want to do any demos on any of the products that we touched on today, um, feel free. But that's kind of like the typical flow that I like to tell customers about. Um, but for the umbrella, trial right now. So typically the platform is going to be uh, a 14 day trial. Cisco actually expanded that out to 19 days. And um, like Chris alluded to earlier, we will be sending the slide deck out to everybody. So don't feel like you have to memorize because this is obviously uh, kind of an eyesore of a chart. So don't think you need to jot all this stuff down. I'll kind of summarize it for you. But like I said, it's going to go up to 90 days. You simply go up to uh, signup.umbrella.com you select the 14 day trial and then within that platform, you can request a 90 day trial. Um, for existing customers, obviously we wanna you know, help those partners that are already using Umbrella and didn't plan to be in an atmosphere that's not in the corporate environment. You're actually gonna be able to um, exceed your user amount until July 1st. So after July 1st, um, at least for right now, the plan of it being is that um, let's say you had 10 users and you bumped yourself up to 20 through this time period, you would need to purchase the additional 10 users if you planned on using those past July 1st. Um, so that's kind of be a, a common theme um, with the next three promotions that I go over because all of these are going to be going strictly right now at least until July 1st. Um, if anything changes, obviously anybody on the um, call today will update to make sure you guys are aware. So Duo, so their offer is a little bit different of a platform. So they're not expanding the, the trial itself. So the trial is still going to be 30 days. But the caveat is there used to be a 10 user maximum limit. Now they're expanding that. Um, basically, there's not a maximum limit of users set right now. They can simply just go into the trial and um, demo it for as many users as they need be. Like I said, um, that's going to be over as soon as July 1st hits. And any open opportunity customers, you would actually... Um, if you already have a dual subscription going on, you could simply go into the dual platform console 
and exceed the users as well. So like I said, Umbrella and Duo are very much the same, meaning that you can simply, if you have an existing purchase or an existing customer, go into the console and exceed the users. But like I said, anything that goes over needs to be um, rectified after July 1st. All right, so I'm gonna go right to the AnyConnect offer right now. So with regards to um, AnyConnect, the trial's gonna be a little bit different as well. So what we have out there previously was 30 days. They're gonna bump that up to 90 days, and then they're also gonna allow any existing end customer um, to increase the user limit as well. So like I said, um, these seem like a lot of information that Cisco packed onto the slides, but it's pretty um, cut and dry, honestly. And if you guys wanted to have a one-off conversation with me about it, just to make sure you guys feel comfortable and know how to access the demos and the trials, like I said, I'll send the deck out, but I'm more than happy to have any one-off conversations as well. Um, the last offer that we have, so this is actually brand new. So when we previously rolled the COVID offers out, it was in March. Um, as of this month, they actually just added AMP for endpoints because um, we had a couple uh, customers give some feedback from Cisco that that's something they would like to see added if possible. And Cisco listened and, you know, here we go. So right now, um, Previously, you could do um, 50, 50, <clears throat> what was it? sorry about that. You could do 50 devices for up to 60 days. So right now the term is gonna stay the same. So it's gonna be 60 days. However, you're gonna allowed to have up to 1,000 1, trial endpoint licenses. Um, and then for existing customers, as you can see over to the left-hand corner, you're gonna be allowed to exceed up to twice the purchase endpoint count until July. Um, first. So like I said, just some really awesome caveats that Cisco is throwing to any of the security partners because we want to make sure um, during this time to cause, you know, we don't want to cause even more chaos that's going out there right now. So anything that Cisco and Ingram can do to help you guys out, obviously let us know. But like I said, feel free to contact any of us to schedule a demo for any of the products that we went over. But with that being said, I want to make sure Jess has some time to go over the different financing offers that Cisco's offering right now. So Jess, I'm going to pass you the ball and you should be good to go. Awesome. Thanks, Colin. Hi, everyone. I just want to take a moment to touch on Cisco Capital's new program available to all partners, the Business Resil Resiliency Program. So this program is designed to help customers acquire the solutions that are needed while managing short-term cash flow and liquidity challenges stemming from the current state of the COVID crisis. So essentially this program allows for a 90-day payment deferral for all new Cisco hardware, software, and services opportunities. Following the payment deferral, customers pay only 1% of the total contract value each month until the end of the 2020 calendar year. Then beginning January 2021, remaining monthly payments start commencing. So this is available in a 36, 48, and 60 month option. This offer is available until July 25th, 2020. So I can't stress enough, in order to qualify, orders must be booked by that date. Cisco will be hosting a webinar tomorrow, April 30th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern to go through all Cisco Capital options that are available to partners and to specifically take a deep dive on this program discuss all the details and answer any and all questions that you may have. I highly recommend that if you're interested in the program, you attend. I'll make sure to drop the link in the chat for everyone. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Colin to wrap up. Thanks, Jess. No problem. All right. So this is just a contact sheet for any of the presenters that we had on today. So like I said, feel free to reach out to any of us. We're more than happy to tackle any of your questions or concerns.